Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I'd like to continue this series of videos over the book, The Five Proofs of the Existence of God by Edward Fazer. This is a response to a patient's request and is a part of the School of Forbidden Texts. Remember, you can join us there for as little as just $2 per month. Link to my Patreon is in the video description. So I noted in the first video of the series about a week ago over at Aristotle that um, this book, contrary to my own expectation, really is not um, a historical analysis of what each one of these thinkers thought a long time ago in which he walks you through a bunch of textual citations but largely dismisses the proof itself as a product of the particular historical context which it emerged from, which, by the way, is how such a book would usually look within the academic industry. No, instead of doing that, Fazer shows how each one of these proofs remains relevant today despite enormous progress admittedly within the realm of empirical natural science. We found last week, for example, that Aristotle, of all people, um, is even more convincing in light of the recent findings of quantum physics, which Edward Fazer himself understands very well, despite the, um, the comical irony that um, Aristotle himself is largely thought of or portrayed stereotypically as the very inhibition which had to be overcome in order for modern science to take place. We're told that the scientific revolution happened one fine day when people realized they could no longer just quote from Aristotle's texts, the physics, um, verbatim in Latin. They had to actually go out and start observing and experimenting. Well, the more that they observed, experimented, and mathematically formalized, it seems, the more they confirmed Aristotle's insight, um, not just with regard to the natural realm, but even with regard to the proof for the existence of God himself. Now, we're going to find an even bigger challenge this week in that um, it's still possible to be a contemporary Aristotelian because he's associated loosely within uh, the general um, population with the idea of um, materialism, right? Whereas Plato is uh, associated with the truly untenable position of idealism. And in fact, um, Zizek noted that um, Plato is one of three thinkers within the history of Western philosophy whose influence over the history of Western philosophy was precisely that everyone who came after them had to refute them. The other two of these thinkers are Descartes and Hegel. Um, and if you uh, read the literature written after each one of these figures, a lot of time is simply dedicated to showing how they were wrong. Well, Plato is arguably the least tenable of those three because he was talking about things like, you know, the world of ideas. But um, if you've been following the um, series over the Platonic Dialogues group reading challenge within the School of Forbidden Texts, um, you will have noticed um, already, I think, that for Plato, the plurality of ideas, even within the world of forms, is in a certain sense secondary to this other thing, which you will be led to if you continue progressing to enlightenment, even within the world of ideas, you'll find the one beyond or even more true, more beingful than the plurality of ideas, which are already far more beingful than the plurality of material entities in this life, which instantiate each one of those forms. Well, the word for this mysterious one, which um, in the Parmenides, um, we don't get very clear clear answers regarding, except that we know that has something to do with the conflict between the whole and its many parts, in which case, in the Parmenides, the question is, how can um, the one be a one if every time you try to talk about it, you fall into a plurality of parts? Well, um, the word for that one, when we get to the Neoplatonist philosopher Plotinus, well, the word for that one is actually God. And therefore, whereas last week in the Aristotelian proof, the thing that really interested us was um, beginning with the insight that change occurs, and then that leads us to have to posit um, the proof of God's existence. Well, this week, we're going to start with the common sense insight that any thing you consider is a whole which is composed of parts. And for that very reason, we will be led to conclude that God must exist. All right, so as we get into the content of the text itself, we find that just as last week, Phaser contradicted the expectations of those who have only a halfway clear understanding for the Aristotelian proof of the existence of God, by actually not talking about, on the one hand, a moment of creation, which was a particular moment where time began, in which if you could just show that time had no beginning, or if you could show that before the Big Bang there was other time before that, um, it would seem superficially easy to disprove this idea of the first mover. The other thing about the stereotypical and 
um, flawed understanding of the first mover is that the kind of change which he um, really brought into existence that we care about is um, the change uh, of the universe itself as a whole from nothing into something. If you could show that there is no such thing as the universe as a whole, it would seem superficially easy to show that Aristotle's understanding of the first mover could not possibly be tenable in a modern era. Well, Phaser showed that you don't need to talk about a moment of creation in time, and you don't have to talk about the ultimate object, which is the universe as a whole. You could start with something much closer to home, including the cup of coffee, which is probably sitting right in front of you on your desk as you are reading this book. And this is something which can exhibit the kind of change. His example was the cup of coffee is hot, when it's first brewed and it becomes cold a little bit later, but we're not even so much concerned, as I mentioned last week, about the, the, the time element here. It's rather that the same thing can exhibit different properties because it's capable of change. Well, that um, cup of coffee is sufficient to lead you to posit God as the one who transitively allows those changes to take place because he is not capable of change precisely defined as the shift from potentiality to actuality because he's purely actual. Well, this week, once again, we do not start the Neoplatonist proof with lofty statements about the world of ideas and all of the um, questions of whether that could still be tenable in modern era. No, no, no. He shows that the problem of uh, a whole and its parts, which will lead you ultimately to talk about a god who um, exists in a way radically different from those ordinary things. Um, well, you could start with something as close to home as maybe the chair that you're sitting on, okay, as you're reading this book. This chair is made of parts. Um, we see that there's an armrest here. There's this thing to uh, rest your back. Uh, there's the part that holds your butt above the ground. Um, those are parts, and we know that um, together they make up a whole, which is the chair, but in a certain sense, the chair as a whole is more like a composite. Uh, because um, the parts seem to have a certain priority in that the carpenter who, who made this, or rather this is a plastic chair, so the plastic factory that created this, um, had to have created the parts before it could have assembled them into a composite whole. But um, that's not the only example that proves um, this in the sense that even if you go beyond um, the kind of human techne, to use the ancient Greek term, in which um, the skilled intervention of some human um, uh, accounts for the creation of this composite. Even if you go beyond that, there are um, things produced by nature which also are holes made up of hearts. You could go even closer to home than the chair you're sitting on and simply go to your own self. Well, the human body also has parts. You'll see that this part is an arm, this part is a head, I also have legs, and in a certain sense these are parts which make up a composite whole, but there seems to be a vicious cycle in which the question of well, what is an arm, well you can only really understand what an arm is if you understand it in terms of the body which it plays a role in. The arm is the thing which allows me to move my hand to be able to grab the cup of coffee I want. Uh, the leg, well, what is that? I can define it in terms of its ability to help the whole body change its location through walking. So once again, we have a vicious cycle here because on the one hand, the um, parts seem to have a priority over the whole because if it is a composite, then the whole only emerges secondarily after the fact, after those parts are put together. If you take the example of a chair, you have um, the carpenter actually um, assemble all of them together and that accounts for how they're able to be a chair rather than so many isolated pieces of wood. Um, but on the other hand, it seems that the whole has a logical priority over its parts because with the human body, for example, well, what is an arm? Well, it's only really an arm if it is serving the interests of the whole, which is allowing me to grab things. I think it was Aristotle who said that if you were to um, disconnect an eye from a body, it would no longer be an eye. I mean, it might be the body part of a pupil, but it's only an eye if it's really serving the body as a whole by allowing it to see. So the way to um, get out of this vicious cycle uh, between the part and the whole is to realize that insofar as composition accounts for it being a whole with parts, um, things cannot be self-composing. They have to have a cause for that composition beyond themselves. And for, Arist for medieval Aristotelianist terms, um, this is the efficient cause. And you can find an efficient cause um, for examples as different as the chair and the human body in the sense that Aristotle understood the term techne to mean 
the um, human skill of the carpenter, which through a certain willful intervention um, causes these parts to be assembled in just this way. That is something which we could call literally artificial as telling us what the translators mean when they um, uh, talk about Techne's art. Okay, but um, in contrast with that, you have the composition of the human body parts into a body through the natural means of um, human reproduction. Okay, so the efficient cause, according to Aristotle, of the baby is its father. Now, that's something which maybe will seem uh, patriarchal today, but we're for the moment only concerned with understanding Aristotle in his own historical context, regardless of whether such a statement might seem politically incorrect today. Let's for the moment accept that there are differences between um, maybe the technical means of having that composition come about through an efficient cause and um, the natural means, which um, on a level of fusis, which is the term that Aristotle would use here, um, can also account for that. But either way, you have to have an efficient cause beyond the thing which is composed because the thing's composition cannot be self-causing. The question once again, is whether this only concerns a moment in time within the past. If you take the examples I just mentioned, you would likely argue that the composition of the pieces of wood into the composite of a chair can be fully explained by the moment in time in the past when the carpenter was laboring to put them together. Okay. Uh, similarly, you could argue that the composition of so much uh, physical stuff into a person um, occurred, um, the composition occurred at the moment of human reproduction when, according to Aristotle's understanding of this, the efficient cause of the father imparted his seed. Well, in one sense, those are true. Those are valid explanations. But um, this uh, descent back into the past to try to do the detective work of finding an origin sometime back there, that will lead you ultimately to fall into something which Phaser is not interested in at this moment, which of, of course is finding the moment in time when creation occurred and the universe as a whole was the thing that was composed uh, into a whole from its many parts. Now, that is something you might be interested in in another context, but for the moment, Phaser wants to show that the idea of a part and a whole relation requiring a principle of uh, composition beyond its own self would hold true not only if you descend back in time in a linear series, but even if you posit a hierarchical series, which um, can hold true for a single moment in time. Just as last week we saw that um, the uh, cup of coffee's a potential to be three feet off the ground if it's sitting on your desk um, is indeed being actualized, but it's not being actualized by its own self. It's being actualized by the table which is allowing it to to be that far above the ground. Well, this leads you to ask, what is actualizing the table's potential to be in that position? Well, that's the floor. What's actualizing that potential? Well, it's the foundation of the house. What's actualizing that potential? Well, it's the earth below it, um, and so forth and so on. This sort of hierarchical series um, applies not only to investigations of motion as the shift from potential to actual we saw last week, but also concerns the problem of how parts can be composed into holes in that if you take the example of the chair, not the chair that I'm sitting on because it's plastic, it's a better example for Phaser's own chair, uh, which is uh, made of wood. Well, it is true that the composition of those parts into a hole, uh, you can credit that uh, to the carpenter's act of laboring in the past, but even long after that moment is over, it's still holding together as so many parts within a composite hole because something else is allowing or causing that coherence to um, still, uh, you know, hold good for that chair. And those are factors which can be um, listed out within a hierarchical rather than linear series, much like we saw with the coffee cup last week. For example, what exactly is allowing those pieces of wood to hold together with those screws which um, allow the chair to have a certain proper form rather than fall apart? Well, one thing we can say is allowing that to hold together is the temperature itself. If the temperature became too hot, the metal screws would melt. If it became too hot, the wood would catch fire. And this is something which, um, once again, gives you a hierarchical series, which keeps going and going and going all the way down to um, extremely 
um, you know, fine details, like how much oxygen is within the atmosphere. There was one Christian apologist on television years ago who was arguing that um, the universe had to have been intelligently designed by a god rather than the product of uh, random chance, uh, because even if the oxygen level were slightly altered within the atmosphere, life would become impossible. If I remember him correctly, if it was just a little bit less, it would be impossible for us to breathe. If it was just a little bit more, everything would catch fire. So you could see that um, the chair is composed um, into a hole from its parts, um, certainly within the linear series of time when the carpenter uh, put it together, but that's only a very small part of the story. Right now, you have to account for things like the amount of X oxygen within the atmosphere to show why this is not catching fire, um, and I guess if you extend it to the human person, how I'm able to breathe at the moment. All of these things, you know, not just the chair, but every example you can think of, ultimately will find a certain relation of dependency in which it can only hold the status of a whole if so many other things are also composed if we think of the um, the oxygen level within the atmosphere allowing breathing and also allowing us to not catch fire. Well, that is something which is also a type of composition which ultimately has to end with a first composer. And we all know the name of that, which would be a god. But we have to talk a lot more about why the things we just mentioned about composition would not hold true for such a god. Now, if we're interested this week in giving the proof for the existence of God in terms of the problem of the composition of parts into wholes, we have to stop for a moment and give a much better definition of what such parts might actually be. Now, it is useful to get you started thinking about this using um, very common sense examples like um, the different pieces of wood that go up to make a chair, um, such as we have this chunk of the chair here, which is the armrest, and we have the part that's holding your butt above the ground, and those are parts, but they're um, kind of the least interesting ones. Um, in Husserl's own uh, 20th century text, Logical Investigations, the third logical investigation is dedicated to parts and holes, and he says, well, sure, um, a, a, a certain kind of part is um, a piece or a chunk, a rough translation of the German term he uses, um, but uh, far more interesting for us um, are not only the uh, the logical parts and holes which uh, Husserl was interested in 20th century phenomenology, but even way back in the ancient medieval eras, we have metaphysical parts, um, such as for Aristotle, we have uh, form and matter as two different parts, despite the fact that um, you can never actually separate them except in an act of abstraction. Something which will likely surprise the first-time reader of Aristotle is that when you're learning about um, the material cause of this gold ring, for example, is uh, it's made of the matter of gold, um, and it has a form of a ring which could be instantiated by different kinds of matter, like, say, silver. It could be made of, of like, bronze or some other type of metal. Um, you, you do have a distinction between, well, it's the same form of a ring in all those examples, and the way that they're distinguished is that one is made of the matter of gold, one is made of silver. Well, the thing that might surprise you is that um, you don't ever actually encounter any such thing as unformed matter of gold unformed matter of silver, unformed matter of bronze. No, no, no. You can separate these things, but only through a certain act of abstraction, like the one we just performed, despite the fact that you cannot uh, limit the existence of the formal and material cause to any psychological grounds. It's not simply that um, they're distinct from one another in the psychological realm of my mind. They're different mental contents. No, no, no. These really are different from one another with this in the level of reality, okay? The material cause and the formal cause. And this is something we have to account for as another example of composition. Uh, the form and the matter are different parts, far more fundamentally than the different chunks or pieces of this chair, which can be taken apart and then put back together through an artificial intervention on the part of the carpenter. Well, you can only really separate the different parts of form and matter in abstraction, despite the fact that, once again, the difference between the two is not psychological, but actually metaphysical. Well, what is maybe even more mysterious than the parts of form and matter are the parts of essence and existence. Now, I mentioned last week that um, for Thomas Aquinas, you have um, different members of the same kind of thing because you can clarify um, what that kind of thing would be on a universal level beyond all of the contingencies of its members because if you use uh, the kind of uh, taxonomy which was um, which was um, employed in the Middle Ages, you could describe um, humans in general 
or rather humankind as a single universal type, um, by specifying that it um, lies within the genus Homo, in that uh, we're hominids, okay, but it's different from the from the other hominids through the specific difference of sapiens, which means basically that we're the knowing or rational humans, uh, sapere in Italian, to this day is the infinitive for to know. So um, we have the specific difference for Aristotle, um, animal with logos. Logos tells us specifically how humans in general would be different from other hominids, uh, but this is a universal essence which, uh, in a certain sense, we can abstract from the many members of that type which we, ex which we encounter in the real world, but every time we encounter one of those, it is itself a composition of that essence of the Homo sapiens with um, the existence of that particular kind of thing, which we could also think of in, in material and formal terms as, well, we have the same essential form of, of being knowing beings, but there are many differences between you and I because um, the particular composition of matter with form for you results in um, different, uh, say, eye color, hair color, height, and a lot of these differences um, are accounted for in terms of privations. We have the same potentialities due to being the same kinds of things, it's just that some are actualized more in some than others. Well, um, beyond form and matter, which we just considered, now we can think of the composition of essence with existence. If you compose those two, then you get specific members of a series. If all you have is the essence, you don't have specific members, at least of the kind of things which we are, which are humans. Now, the difficulty here is that for Thomas Aquinas as a medieval thinker, he had to um, talk about the um, uh, entities, which are real entities, but are not composed of form and matter because they're spiritual beings like angels. Uh, it seems humorous to us today to realize that for Thomas Aquinas, because there are many angels, okay, and because angels are not composed of matter and form, the only way for him to account for the many angels was to say, well, there is no, there isn't really a, a single species um, of angels, uh, or excuse me, a single universal species of the angel in the singular, which all of these then instantiate through composing it. It's rather that every angel has to be its own species, because precisely because you cannot fall back on the parts of form and matter to show how they are different from one another. Well, even more complicated would be trying to account for the one God who lacks parts um, purely, rather than lacking specific kinds of parts as the angels do. The, the kinds of parts which angels lack are uh, form and matter, but um, if I remember correctly, they still compose the essence which they are with the existence, or the, the essence of their own species, even though they're the unique um, member of it, with their existence as particular angels, and that's what allows you to account for the many of them as um, finite created beings. They are not God themselves. So God has to take us to something even more mysterious than that, which is the idea of a one which is a one because it has no parts. And not just the segments or chunks which a chair does, or like the body parts, I have an arm, I have a leg. No, no, no. For him, the kinds of parts which he does not have specifically are that he does not have form and matter which are composed, and he does not have essence and existence which are composed, in which case the essence of God would pre-exist its combination with an existence of a particular god and that composition of the two in an act of creation would make him uh, basically the same as the angels. No, no, no. For God, there are no such parts, which means that the way you talk about his existence has to be simply that his existence is his essence because his essence is to exist. We can say other things about such a god. For example, we can say that because he lacks any parts, especially the metaphysical parts, um, he's absolutely simple. And if he is absolutely simple, there could be only one of him for the way to distinguish one uh, a member of a type from another once again simply would not apply here. Okay, you could not uh, as account for the differences between you and I um, in terms of privations because as we saw last week, uh, there is no shift from potentiality to actuality for him. In addition, such a god would be incapable of change because now we're interested in defining change, not as the shift from potentiality to actuality as was the case last week, but this week we're interested in defining change as losing a part, gaining a part, etc. Well, if he has no parts, then he 
can't change. Well, somebody might um, uh, raise their voice at this point and say, oh, but wait a minute, the traditional definition of God, even on rational grounds, as being omnipotent or capable of all things, all powerful, of being omniscient or all knowing, knowing all things, and being omnibenevolent, uh, being all good in contrast with the fallen nature of humans, those are themselves parts. You've just said he's all-knowing, he's all-powerful, and he's all-good, and this is um, what leads uh, some skeptics to posit paradoxes in which these different parts of God are, would seem to be incompatible with one another. The idea that uh, God, um, if he really is all-powerful, would be powerful enough to create a boulder so large that even he couldn't lift it, that is a paradox, really a pseudo-paradox, um, which we'll get to in a later proof for the existence of God. But um, Phaser shows that um, these actually are not different parts of the one God. Rather, they are different ways that humans have of using language to talk about the same thing. For this, he brings up the difference between sense and reference in Frege. If you remember, Frege noted that um, the name um, Evening Star and Morning Star, uh, the names have different senses on a logical level, even though um, they're actually, you find out later, uh, referring to the same thing. There's only one star, which is both the evening star and the morning star, but um, even though uh, there's only one referent there, um, the senses within logic actually are different. Well, we have something a little bit like that now. There's only one thing we are talking about when we say that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. It's just that in addition to these being different words that we use for the same thing, um, we also have a different difference between the way that that word is used when it's talking about God and the way it is used when it's talking about us. For this, he recalls the difference between uh, univocal uh, meaning, equivocal meaning, and analogical meaning. Very quickly, if you say, to use his own example, that um, Fido is a dog and Bruno is a dog, um, they're both using the word dog the same way because they're both the same kind of thing. You could, however, also use a word equivocally. Equivocation is the logical fallacy of using what has the same surface level form within language but actually means different things. His own example is um, you could talk about a bat which um, somebody in the cricket game was swinging at a ball, but you can also talk about a bat which was flying in the air and eating fruit. Okay, you see both of those bats here in India, the cricket bat and the fruit bat, but um, the word is used, being used in a totally different way. Then you have the analogical use of a word. When we say that God is good, we uh, might uh, be speaking analogically. Uh, with relation to the kind of goodness which humans can have. Humans can also be good, and there might be um, a, an analogical relation between the goodness of a human and the goodness of God, but they're not the same thing. We're not using the word in the same way. The univocal sense that we would with Fido and Bruno are both dogs. Similarly, when we say that humans are intelligent, um, and then we call God all-knowing, there's an analogical relation between the intelligence of us and his intelligence, but they're not the same thing. Similarly with, um, what was the other one? The, the power. We're capable of things, but uh, the kind of power we have is analogically like the power of God, but they're not the same thing. And this is because, once again, God would not have parts called intelligence, power, and goodness. Rather, if you are talking about that which lacks any imperfection of potentiality because it's purely actual, as we saw last week, and which lacks any parts because it is not composed of form and matter or essence and existence, you're really talking about that, which is all of the things I just mentioned, perfectly good, perfectly knowing, and perfectly powerful. It's just that we as limited humans have to accommodate that infinite essence, that infinite um, thing to the finitude of our mind. So this was a lot of fun. I look forward to the next week. Thank you very much.